All right. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm City Councilmember Tyler Dos Santos Tam. I'm the chair of the Transportation Committee and the Executive Matters and Legal Affairs Committee. And uh, welcome to my district, District 6, which goes from Ward Avenue to Middle Street. And this is actually uh, the home, my district will be the home of a future uh, social housing project that Senator Stanley Chang uh, fought for uh, to be placed at Mayor Wright Homes. And I, there's a number of other uh, really exciting housing programs that are coming up in my district. I see Craig Hirai here, who um, has had many years of working in this area. Um, in Kakako, in Kalihi, there's lots of things coming up. Uh, just before we start, a few housekeeping notes. Um, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. Um, as we know, Singapore has a great housing program. They also have a great uh, criminal program, so please don't break any of the rules here. You'll get it. <laughs> if you do need to step out, uh, the restrooms are outside. Um, you, sh you have to go to the sidewalk to the next building over, and restrooms are inside to the right. Uh, but tonight, we have the honor of hosting Professor Sak Yang Fang, who is currently a visiting scholar at the University of Hawaii at Manoa's Department of Economics. She comes to us from the Singapore Management University, where she is the Celia Mo Chair Professor of Economics. As a top expert on Singapore's housing system, she's authored books, including Policy Innovations for Affordable Housing in Singapore and Housing Finance Systems, Market Failures and Government Failures. She's been a consultant to the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, and has served on the boards of Singapore's Urban Redevelopment Authority and Land Transport Authority. Singapore, how many people here have been to Singapore? Ah, okay. A good number. For those of you who haven't, um, you should go. You would really be amazed. Singapore boasts, of course, one of the best housing systems in the world. It's incredibly diverse. Um, we talk about Hawaii being diverse, but Singapore is incredibly diverse. It's at the crossroads of uh, Southeast Asia, East Asia, and South Asia. It's half the size of Oahu. So it's about the same size as Molokai, but has five times the population of Oahu. And if you've ever visited Singapore, you notice that actually much of that country, even though it's half the size of Oahu, is green, it's forested, um, it's clean and orderly. Uh, don't even think about spitting on the sidewalk. Um, the last person that did that, uh, we never heard from them ever again, but that's okay. Uh, Singapore shows that you can have a large population in an in inexpensive, well-maintained housing system. People have a shot at home ownership there. Everyone has a shot at home ownership there, from the, the folks checking you out at the convenience store to you know the, the top CEOs at, at these major companies that are based in Singapore. Everyone has a shot. And um, Singapore, of course, has many things that we don't have uh, going for it. And, but they do not have a magic wand. They've learned to adapt and they've learned to create this model, and we have some lessons to learn. And so I look forward to hearing the professor's insights and how we can do that. Um, as a personal aside, I actually just came back from Maine. I came back this afternoon. And while I was there, I met with two of their state legislators, both of whom brought up unpromptedly the Singapore housing model, because I was talking about how affordable housing here is such a big issue. And so this is something that the world is taking notice of, um, even in the furthest away state from us uh, in Maine. After her presentation, um, we'll open the floor up for Q&A. Um, so to ask a question, raise your hand, and one of the volunteers will bring you a mic. And so please join me in extending a warm aloha to Professor Sak Young Fang. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't know if you want to use this one. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much, um, Councillor Santos Tam, for that very nice introduction. Um, and I'm so glad that you're interested in the Singapore housing model, and I'm here to kind of. Oh, okay. Um, this is the outline of my presentation. Um, I'll first talk about Singapore's public policy context, and then I will uh, go into some detail on Singapore's housing experience. And in the last part, I will compare Singapore with Honolulu's uh, housing context. And uh, throughout, I will be using US dollars, but where I use Singapore dollars, um, the exchange rate is roughly Singapore dollars to um, 
77 US cents, about three quarters of a uh, uh, US dollar. Okay, so Singapore's public policy context. Okay, in the US, I've noticed that public policy are often labelled as isms, whether it's conservatism, liberalism, neoliberalism. I'm learning all the different isms that exist <laughs> in the US. And, uh, in an urban context, there's uh, libertarianism, nimbism, imbism. And policy debates, however, in Singapore tend to avoid the use of such uh, labels. Um, and indeed, the founding Prime Minister, Mr Lee Kuan Yew, described his approach to policy making in Singapore in these words. If there was only one if there's one formula for our success, it was that we were constantly studying how to make things work and how to make them work better. Okay, I was never a prisoner of any theory. What guided me was reason and reality. I made a practice of finding out who else had faced the same problem that we had and then I would and uh, how they had tackled it and how successful they had been. So this was his approach and the acid test that he would apply to every theory or scheme was would it work? And this was the golden thread that ran through his years in office. If it did not work or if the results were poor, Singapore would not waste more time and resources on it. This is his quote um, in his memos uh, in 2000. And this approach towards policy making actually is most consistent with what I would cons what we call the mechanism design or market design approach. And this area of economics is actually pioneered in the US. Um, Professor Eric Muskin at Harvard University won the Nobel Prize in 2007 for this approach, which he described as the theory of mechanism design can be thought of as the reverse engineering side of economics. Okay, we begin by identifying our desired outcome or social goal. Then we ask whether or not an appropriate institution or mechanism could be designed to attain that goal. And that if the answer is yes, then we want to know what form that mechanism might take. So this whole, this whole area of um, economics now regarding market design, auction theory, which revolves around how to achieve specific goals um, in society. And Singapore's approach, I think, is best reflective of this um, approach in terms of designing institutions and policies to meet social goals. In terms of policy implementation, uh, in Singapore, it's facilitated by effective interagency coordination due to its status as a city-state. With only one level of government and also a single level um, of land use planning and a single housing authority. So this is um, a kind of one authority for housing which, uh, which became the largest developer in Singapore even, essentially. So this is a policy context in Singapore. So I will now go into the next part of my presentation which is to give you the background of Singapore's housing experience a bit of the history, um, how policy has evolved, the leasehold system that we use in Singapore, and then the fiscal impact of our policies. Okay. Um, in, in the context, Singapore has 6 million people. We have a very small land area, just 734 square kilometres. And our unusual housing policies must be understood in the context of this very small land area. Okay, it's both a city and an independent republic. And as a city-state, it has to fit all the requirements of a normal functioning country, which includes a commercial land for commercial use, industrial use, um, the gateway ports and airports, military training grounds, reservoirs for water, parks, etc. So land is very scarce and has to be very carefully um, allocated for the various users. Um, in contrast, I mean, to Hawaii, I mean, um, Oahu is twice the size of Singapore. There's 20% uh, of the population. So you are not as land scarce as we are. And, um, and therefore, um, the kind of policies that you require would be quite different from uh, the Singapore context. 
Um, so look at if you look at the housing stock because of that land scarcity, most of the housing stock is high rise. Okay, um, housing and development board, which is the housing authority in Singapore, um, and the largest developer, it is a state owned developer. It, it has built seventy one percent housing units in Singapore, and this is actually um, uh, across twenty seven towns and estate managed by the HDB. Uh, Ninety four percent of the HDB housing stock has been sold to um, citizens uh, first and on a 99 year leasehold basis uh, only 6% of HDB stock is rental and but the private housing sector is a smaller uh, sector in Singapore 25, about 24% high rise condominiums these are both freehold and leasehold um, and then we have the very small landed housing sector just 5% of the housing stock is uh, landed housing, which is mostly freehold land. So um, this is a very different housing context in terms of density. And this is the medium house type in Singapore. I think here in the US, you are used to single family homes. But in Singapore, the medium house type and the most common house type is a four room HDB flat, 99 year lease, about 1,000 square feet. And the market price is slightly less than half a million US dollars it's quite expensive uh, uh, in the US context um, but the most households most first time home owners will not pay that market price they would enjoy a very much subsidised price from the HDB uh, if you look at the medium house price to household income ratio uh, in the Singapore context um, this is the medium house price of the HDB forum flat is um, 4.7 times our medium household income. And that medium, uh, that price to ratio, income ratio, which is, a, which is an indicator of housing affordability, is relatively low compared to house price to income ratios uh, in many of the global cities and also in some of the high house price cities in the US. So in Honolulu, um, you have close to 9.6 times uh, house price to income ratio but here you are referring to a single family house rather than the than the flat so this is the context in which singapore has operated and the western home ownership rate is about 90 percent so th how did singapore achieve these outcomes of very high home ownership rate plus relatively affordable housing uh, for within the context of a very small land area uh, so to answer that question of how Singapore so-called soft housing, uh, I'll take you back to the history of uh, how we came about with a housing model. So the historical development housing framework was in the 60s. I mean, in the 1950s was a very bad period in terms of housing. It was uh, considered a housing crisis. It was post-war. Um, peace time, people were coming back to Singapore. Uh, the housing stock had been badly damaged by the war, there was rent control, so we had um, a situation where households were crammed into very overcrowded shop houses, there were squatter settlements, and this was the housing crisis that we faced in the 1950s, when Singapore was a, still a British colony. Um, Singapore was founded as a British trading post in 1819. Okay? So um, this is a some pictures of uh, what housing was like in the 1950s and up to 1970s. So this is, these are uh, pictures in the central area in Chinatown um, and near the Civic District. Um, with the, there was a fire station, a uh, central fire station which is still around today. Uh, these are shop houses which was the most dominant house type in the, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, these are zinc, a category of housing called zinc and attack roof houses which still existed up to the 1980 census um, basically squatter settlements and villages uh, which were uh, made from makeshift materials so this was a kind of housing that the, um, Singapore faced at the time of independent um, self-government okay Singapore was given self-government by the British colonial government in 1959 I think about the same time that Hawaii became a state of the US. So um, immediately upon winning the election, um, the People's Action Party led by Mr. Lee Kuan Yew um, took on um, 
the roads which that they had promised it during the um, election to provide low-cost housing, strengthen education, develop industries, and then to lead the country uh, to attain independence through a merger with Malaysia. So the HDB was set up in 1960 to tackle the housing problems of the times. Okay. In 1963, Singapore merged with Malaysia, Malaysia, Malaya to become the Federation of Malaysia. Okay. So that was 1963, but the union was actually very short-lived. Okay. Within two years, um, on 9 August 65, uh, Malaysia threw us out and we had basically independence trust upon us. So um, there was disagreement between the two uh, countries about the future direction of the Federation. So um, to describe our Independence Day as not a happy occasion would be an understatement. The Prime Minister, uh, in calling a press conference on that day, I mean, shed tears. And in that was the sense of crisis which, um, which uh, prevailed at that point in time. Um, that we're now an independent country, small island, and having to deal with uh, several issues. Um, so this, again, is a quote from our founding prime minister, which, who went on to become prime minister until about 1990, um, a, a good uh, number of decades. So when we, were, when we were confronted with an enormous problem of bad housing, no development, overcrowding, we decided that unless drastic measures were taken to break the law, break the rules, we would never solve it. We therefore took overriding powers to acquire land at low cost. It was in breach of one of the fundamentals of British constitutional law, the sanctity of property. But that had to be overcome because the sanctity of the society to preserve itself was greater. So we acquired at sub-economic rates. So this was um, a situation under which a crisis had resulted in a, a perceived need to change the rules of the game. Okay? So um, the government then took the bold step after independence of passing the Land Acquisition Act in 1966, which gave the state broad powers to acquire land for any public purpose, by any person, corporation or statutory board, for any work or undertaking, which in the opinion of the minister, etc., um, would be beneficial to the public and for any residential, commercial or industrial purpose, basically for any purpose. <laughs> okay? So uh, landowners are, cannot object to the decisions and appeals on compensation was to be made to the appeals board and not to the courts. So this was the Land Acquisition Act of 1966, which provided the land framework for Singapore. Um, but then there were a lot of disagreements over compensation. So later on in 1973, uh, the law was further amended to give the government the power to acquire land at its value on the date fixed at 30th November 1973. Um, and um, in, his, in Mr. Lee's words, I saw no reason why private landowners should profit from an increase in land value brought about by economic development and the infrastructure paid for with public funds. So these sentiments are actually about land value um, and the need to capture land value for public benefit. It's very much aligned with the proposals of the American, uh, 19th century American economic philosopher, Henry George, who believed in um, that land, increments in land value should be taxed and that should actually provide be, um, enough revenue for the state so that the income, taxes on income and on profits uh, could be reduced. And Henry, it's, not, it's no surprise that amongst the people who um, are Georges, they, find, they, they consider Singapore one of the most Georges countries in the world because of what we do with land values there. Um, so the compensation was fixed in 1973. It was uh, at 19th century rates or market rates, whichever was lower. So you had changes to this adjustment to that statutory date um, at various points in time. Um, the three changes marked by those red lines there in, uh, in 86, in um, 92, and in 95. Um, and finally, in 2007, the government decided to, to change the rate to market rates. So from 2007, land acquisition has been at market rates. And by then, by then, the context has changed significantly. Um, and by then, the state had acquired most 
90% of the I own, now by then own 90 percent of the land in Singapore, but you must also remember that a um, large part of the land was also government owned before. Um, it was owned by the British uh, military, etc. All those became state land, and there's also a large part part of the land that is actually reclaimed land because Singapore's land area keeps growing every year because they're uh, making efforts to grow the land mass through land reclamation. So in terms of uh, land use planning, the pl land use planning planning uh, is uh, done by a single planning authority, the Urban Redevelopment Authority, for the entire city-state other than by local compartmentalized municipalities. So the URA um, does both land use and infrastructure planning for Singapore. Um, it first in, um, the planning authority first inherited a master plan that was modelled after the Greater London Plan of 1944 from the British government. But then after independence, uh, the Planning Act was amended over time, first in 19 to give public authorities exemption from master planning uh, restrictions. And in 1964, we had a we instituted a development charge or a betterment charge so that any increment, any development that, that costs an increment in land value would be taxed. And currently the betterment charge tax increments in land value at 70%. Okay. Uh, Singapore had its first land use, long-term land use plan in 1971. And in the 1990s, the master plan was changed to um, from passive updating to the planners, to one that was future oriented. The master plan became one where the master, uh, the planners would indicate what was the vision for the particular plot of land. So that, that gave guidance to the private owners of that plot of land as to what was the development potential that the master plan would permit, whether it was rezoning or upzoning. So that also gave transparency to the planning process as to if you apply according to these um, guidelines, it's likely that the application would be approved. So it was not based on an ad hoc basis in terms of rezoning or upzoning. So the concept plan is revised every 10 years or um, from time to time, and the master plan is reviewed every five years in, accord in accordance with the economic needs of the country. Um, that is the land part, land for housing, and the HDB is the one that builds. But to finance that home ownership, again, in the 60s, there was um, the mortgage market didn't exist for low-income households. Uh, and Households didn't understand the concept of mortgages as well. And so that market failure part was addressed by the government through instituting, um, to changing the rules about what pension savings could be used for. So we, the Central Provident Fund was a pension scheme that was already in place. But um, in 1968, the government, to encourage home ownership, amended the rules so that uh, pension fund savings could be used towards down payments and mortgage payments for housing. And over time, the contribution rates for these pension funds, which are compulsory, uh, increased quite dramatically from 5% for employee and employer to up to 25% for, from employer and employee. But, um, and it was adjusted downwards uh, during recessions and all. But currently, the rate is... 20% for employee, 17% for employee year. So that for a total of 37% of the wage is taken out um, at the point of a wage payment to the uh, Central Provident Fund. And of that 37%, 23% can be used for housing. And that is the kind of target which is kind of been set that the mortgage payments for affordability should not exceed 23%. So that no out-of-pocket payment is involved in terms of um, mortgage payment for most households who are employees. Um, the withdrawal will come from the Central Provident Fund. So this was the kind of framework that was in place by 1968 where the HDB develops housing for sale and for rent, mostly for sale, a 99-year leasehold basis sells it to the households and employees have to make this compulsory savings uh, contributions to the CPF. The HDB gives loans to these households to buy the flats and uh, the CPF would make these down payments and mortgage payments to the HDB 
for the loan uh, for the monthly mortgage payments. So with this system in place, the default rates uh, comes down. It is not the household making a, a voluntary payment and uh, uh, with the with the possibility of default being higher. So um, this system was put in place, and uh, CPF contribution rates went up quite rapidly. Eventually, the commercial banks were allowed into this market to lend to the uh, HDB buyers as well. And the CPF does not manage the funds, but actually buys bonds, uh, government bonds, and the government is the one that invests the CPF funds. Uh, the mortgage rates that the HDB gives are 2.6%. Uh, savings rates are 2.5%, so that there's still that margin of uh, uh, difference between the savings rate and the mortgage rate. Uh, and there's no subprime rate, it's just flat 2.6% for all uh, households taking a loan from the HDB. So the HDB has been the main builder, main developer for housing um, over the years, and you can see that the um, um, in the 70s and 80s, HDB was really on a big building construction boom. In one year, there was 70,000 units being put out in the, uh, in the early 1980s. So new towns were being set up. And in the more recent uh, years, the average um, net supply of HDB flats had been about 20,000 units a year, which is fairly um, aligned with the first-time marriage rates for Singapore, for Singaporeans uh, getting married and starting their household. Uh, and with that increase in supply and the HDB and the CPF system in place, um, you can see that the home ownership rate actually went up tremendously between 1970 to 1990. In 20 years, the home ownership rate went from uh, about 30% to 90%, an increase of 60% home ownership. Uh, so by 1990s, uh, the housing, the housing um, crisis had been solved. Almost everybody um, was uh, properly housed, and uh, that was um, when that was when Singapore entered another phase of housing policy development in terms of developing markets for housing. Uh, in terms of sizes that are on offer, um, the sizes range from two room flats to multi-generation flats. So that's the range of sizes from um, about 400 square feet to uh, 1,200 square feet. And there are also rules in place to curb shoe, what we, call, we call them shoebox units, two small units uh, in the private housing sector okay, to prevent developers from building units that are too small and not suitable for uh, families. So those are um, those are guidelines given by the by the planning authority. So in the 1990s, um, with the, uh, housing policy evolution, the HDB resale market was deregulated, um, and that's where actually there's a very the different uh, um, schools are taught about market forces for a for a publicly subsidized good. Okay, so. Um, the households who buy a flat can sell the flat on a private market um, to eligible buyers um, and um, the prices after that deregulation uh, eligible buyers will include those who did not meet the income eligibility criteria for buying a new flat it also included permanent residents in Singapore but not foreigners and each, per each household is only allowed one flat uh, purchase and to own one flat or rent one flat at any point in time. But even then, you can see how rapidly the resale market prices shot up. You know, with the deregulation that was put in place in the early 90s, resale market prices doubled, tripled, and then we had the Asian financial crisis. The HDB prices are the dotted red line, and following uh, the HDB trends, the private housing market prices also shot up. So the decline was during the Asian financial crisis when the market crashed um, and then we had an excess supply of housing. So uh, it's not it's very difficult to try and tame the market as it, um, and to predict what the market might do. But deregulation has a major market impact as to how big the ecosystem of people purchasing their housing is uh, comprises of. So right now um, we there are therefore like three sets of prices for HDB flats. On the extreme right, 
you have the resale market prices, the market prices that um that and the resale market being open to uh, households of any income and permanent residents um, um are much higher. They are both based on market rates and buyers will actually compare HDB prices versus private condominium prices and decide that it's worth it to get a HDB flat at this price. But then the first time homeowners don't pay that price. Okay, there is a listed price on the according to sticker prices, the listed price for the different room, um, for the different flat types for each launch of the that HDB uh, provides. This is a particular development. Uh, these are the prices, and the, the prices would vary by location. And then households. At, the medium income and above will pay that sticker price. And households whose incomes are below the medium uh, and up to 9000 per month, that's about 7000 US dollars, my monthly income, will pay uh, the sticker price minus the grant that the his government is willing to give for lower income households. So it is the sticker, uh, the net price that households pay. So for the same unit, it will go for different prices depending on the income of the households. And the grant amounts to buy a, H uh, a flat from the, gov uh, from the HDB varies with income levels. The lowest household income right now, in, uh, with adjustment just recently last month, will get 120000 Singapore Singapore dollars with the amount decreasing with the household income so that even the lowest income household can afford to buy a, a two-room flat. Um, so th that is the system which actually enables the lowest income household to become a homeowner. Um, I did ask because it was the, some of the sticker listed prices were actually below 120,000. So I did ask the HDB, are you giving away flats for free to <laughs> households with incomes below 1,000? 500 and they say oh well the minimum required is 5% of the listed price so they have some minimum amount that the household is required to pay um, then on the resale market because prices are much higher in the resale market those who choose to buy on the resale market get an additional grant of 80,000 for buying a resale HDB flat and if the resale flat is close to a parent or if the parent is buying a resale flat close to a child, um, there's additional grant of uh, 20000 If they are staying together, they, they get 30000 So, you know, it, it's, uh, it's calibrated according to um, uh, different kinds of uh, households. Um, so after, after the flat, uh, unit is purchased, um, the HDB continues to be the, to own the land and to own a common properties. So that HDB actually is responsible for continuing to upkeep the, uh, the property, the common areas of the property. Um, but that, that responsibility was actually decentralized to town councils uh, in the 1990s. And these town councils are chaired by the members of parliament. So that the, uh, this was in order to uh, promote responsible voting behavior that households would know that there's something at stake if they don't um, if they when they are voting for the member of parliament uh, because the, the way the estate we manage is determined by the member of parliament so the service cons constancy charges are paid to the town councils and uh, for for daily cleaning maintenance and then um, upgrading of common areas lifts etc and um, periodically every five years we'll be painting, we roofing etc so the range of uh, charges for households is from uh, $15 for the smallest flat type to about $78 for the largest flat type just on a monthly basis uh, it's, these charges are actually subsidised because the government actually also continue to support the town councils based on the number of units that they manage so um, again, after sales, there's all these upgrading programs that the government continue to take in order that older estates don't fall into a state of disrepair. So there are lift, grade, uh, lift upgrading programs, uh, reju reju rejuvenation programs as the flat in neighbourhood ages. And um, the government has promised upgrading for the, um, for the flats about 30, when they're about 30 years old and also about 60 years old. 
Um, so these are the time frames by which the entire estate will be upgraded uh, uh, at government exp uh, expense. So another aspect of um, the market is that the government actually has been trying to stabilize house prices. And if you look at the house index indices uh, between 2000 and 2023, um, the house price increases have not been more than the medium household income increases. So um, the price, there's a, the blue line is the medium household income. There is the HDB resale price index, the green line. And then there's the private house price index. So overall, they have been moving, uh, the trends have actually been uh, around, along the same uh, rates. Uh, but this has only been possible because of numerous rounds of, we call them cooling market measures. Okay, so um, the demand is high. Without this demand curbing measures, house prices will actually escalate uh, much higher. And so, um, the cooling measures, uh, there were 17 rounds. I have 16 there, but one round just came into place last month. Um, 17 rounds of cooling measures between 2009 and 2023. Part of it is that the housing is an investment. Or it's all this liquidity flooding the system globally as well. And with low interest rates um, during that period, asset prices were bound to increase. And all these cooling measures were actually put in place um, as what they call anti-speculation or macroprudential measures to prevent bubble, uh, a housing bubble from developing. Um, so you can see that uh, many, most of these measures are regarding the amount of loans that can be, uh, can be taken out for housing. So the, the loan to value ratio caps uh, came into play, goes down as uh, over time. And uh, there are also curbs on debt service ratios, total debt service ratios, etc. Another category of um, cooling measures is the transaction taxes, the stamp duties paid by uh, investors and also foreigners. So investors who buy a second property will pay 20% of the purchase price as an additional transaction tax. And foreigners now pay 60% of the transaction price as a, a, on top of the purchase price. So these taxes have increased over time as well and there was, it was actually felt to be necessary and of course by with the tax at 60%, the foreign demand has actually uh, dried up the last year except for the Americans who have a free trade agreement with Singapore and American citizens are treated the same way as Singapore citizens. So Americans don't pay uh, the foreign additional stamp duty when they purchase housing. Which, uh, and, and, and a few other countries, Switzerland, uh, Liechtenstein, and just, just a few countries that enjoy this privilege. Okay. So um, besides curbing demand, supply is very important. So the HDB has been uh, increasing supply. Uh, and besides the HDB supply, the government actually sells land to the private sector uh, for supply of private housing. So the government, because it owns the largest land, land bank, has this land sales program. Every six months, uh, land sales sites are announced for various purposes, um, commercial, residential, industrial, and these are all leasehold sites. Uh, commercial and residential tends to be 99-year lease. Industrial is 30-year lease. Um, but basically, you can consider them to be PPP arrangements. Okay. For um, in which the government will partner, will choose a private developer to develop housing, uh, say for housing, at, uh, at a specific, specified density and infrastructure is provided by the government and the tender goes out to choose the developer who will, uh, who will, who will build that amount of uh, private housing expected within a stipulated project completion period. Um, so, in one of these one of these schemes under the government land sales program is a housing scheme called the executive condominium scheme, form of PPP. And uh, this in, under this scheme, the government would sell the land to a private developer. The household income cap is sixteen thousand uh, Sing Singapore dollars monthly income per month, which is higher than the HDB income cap. So it's for the medium 
higher middle income households and uh, the requirements are similar to the HDB. They have to live in the flat for five years, minimum occupancy period. And after five years, they can sell to um, anyone without income cap or permanent resident. And after 10 years, it becomes privatized. It's a privatized condominium setup. So in a sense, it continues through this scheme. There's a continuous flow of housing into the private sector as well. Uh, so you can see that the, the market, housing market in Singapore is actually very carefully segmented, right? according to income categories, HDB rental income, HDB three rooms, four rooms, uh, executive condominium, and then we have the resale flats, which are differently regulated. And foreigners are not allowed in the HDB sector or in the landed sector. They can only buy in the private condominium sector then permanent residents are allowed in the resale sector only. And so markets have different conditions for different categories. And how that market, for example, one of the cooling measures was to, uh, to require that permanent residents have had their residency for three, three years before they could purchase a HDB resale flat. So all these regulations kind of curb, I use curb demand for uh, housing. And the other aspect of lease um, expiry, um, there's a big discussion in Singapore because so much of housing is leasehold and uh, what's going to happen when the lease expires. Um, and the, because of that big discussion, the Prime Minister had to clarify this. And in 19, 20, 18, his in his National Day speech, he clarified that 99 years is a long enough time. Okay, We do not have a policy of... Um, Allow, ha, using housing as inheritance for children. Um, uh, it is long enough for a household uh, who gets a flat, say, in their 30s and uh, would, would enjoy the, the duration of the flat or could just sell and upgrade or downgrade, etc. So it's not rental. Um, and if this was not the case, the owners, um, there would become eventually a society where owners would pass their flat on to their children and then you have children who who don't have parents who own a flat etc and that would cause a societal divide so that was the rationale given for not renewing land leases after they expire okay so the message has gone out that there will not be there will be no renewal um, and in the market itself because um, the private housing sector condominium sector has both leasehold and freehold property so one could study what is the difference in uh, the people's willingness to pay for leasehold properties versus uh, freehold we call it fee simple properties here and there's one study which showed that oh, uh, you will control for all the different factors that affect prices leasehold properties will sell for about 10 percent less than uh, freehold properties. And another study look at comparing freehold condominiums with leasehold condominiums and HDB flats and uh, it found that basically in the first 10 years there was not much difference in terms of price depreciation but after 10 years um, the leasehold properties did not perform as well as the freehold properties and after 20 years uh, the HDB properties performed better than the private leasehold properties okay? because the HDB does upgrade and maintain the properties a lot better so this, is a, this was a chart from Agawa and Singh which showed the depreciation um, of uh, prices with H for different types of property okay? so the, um, the black line is the HDB properties and they maintain their values after 20 years much better than the private leasehold properties but and in the Singapore context, though, um, most of the many of the property developments don't don't um, stay around for ninety nine years because they are constantly being redeveloped. Okay, so the the redevelopment schemes would, um, would be uh, what we call a collective sale, where owners will come together and sell their the condominiums and block. Okay, the first sale occurred in nineteen ninety four, so it allows the aging the aged aging developments to be redeveloped thus increasing the supply of properties so the, with the master plan providing the rezoning and upzoning uh, guidelines uh, 
homeowners would come together, vote for a collective sale to take place, and then the site would be redeveloped at a higher density. And uh, it requires 80% consensus now. It used to be 100%, but now it's 80% consensus um, to allow a sale to get to go through. So um, this has been a, a good way in which actually it benefits the existing owners as well as put, uh, increased supply of housing through this redevelopment project uh, pro uh, projects in the private sector. Okay. So in the, in the public housing sector, the HDB has been also fairly active in redeveloping old sites. So, but the HDB doesn't have to, doesn't have this voting mechanism. It just acquires uh, the units from the existing landowners, uh, property owners, and then give them a new flat. Uh, basically, at, but they can top up to to buy a new flat, a new lease, and and then um, the estate is redeveloped from a low density to a high density. Uh, as HDB, HDB estate. Okay, um, this is a picture of the uh, Pinnacle at Duxton uh, near the CBD, 50 story development. This is one of those HDB selective and block redevelopment projects. And now units there are selling at a million dollars per unit. So it's, uh, and I think Senator Chan, you have visited the Pinnacle and you must have visited that. It's like kind of the place where HDB will bring, HDB will bring their visitors uh, to showcase what they, have, uh, what they have achieved in the downtown area. Okay. So um, this has, uh, whether every HDB estate will go to selective and block redevelopment, that was the hope of all HDB owners. But uh, the Prime Minister has announced that it will not be the case, but it has provided for a timeline in which at 70 years, each the blocks could voluntarily vote to undergo a and block redevelopment process because otherwise you will all be having a huge number of units having to be redeveloped at the same time in the future. So this is a voluntary early redevelopment redevelop scheme, but we have not come to that stage yet. But it has been announced. Okay. Um, so we have a whole cocktail of takings and givings. Uh, in the housing sector, with the government, um, land acquisition, land use planning, and HDB supplying housing uh, through, and also the executive condominium scheme and government land sales for private housing. So the land sales for private housing allows the government to actually capture the land value uh, from the government land sales. At the same time, on the demand side, we have the pension fund scheme and as well as lots of taxes on transactions for different categories of buyers. Uh, First-time homeowners enjoy a lot of subsidies. Investors are taxed heavily. Foreigners are taxed heavily uh, for their housing purchase. So there are all these different categories of uh, buyers that are treated differentially so that first-time homeowners are protected, so-called, in being able to buy housing uh, and become homeowners. Um, in terms of government expenditure, the HDB enjoys operating subsidies from the government uh, and the housing subsidies in Singapore rank, uh, I think, about number five after defence, health, education. HDB comes under national development. And the Transport Ministry also gets a lot of um, uh, allocation of government for building in transport infrastructure, the airports, the ports and the rail system. Okay, so that's government expenditure for infrastructure and housing. Um, this is the kind of going to uh, deeper dive into the HDB's finances. Uh, you can see that the HDB actually has sales proceeds that are this is are US dollars, four point five billion, but the cost is higher. They make a loss on their HD on their flats, um, and. They have a deficit, but the deficit is fully covered by a grant from the government. In this, uh, in this particular year, the most recent, the HDB's deficit is five, about five billion, but then it's, co it's covered by the government's operating uh, grant. But at the same time, the HDB is paying the Singapore Land Authority for the land it uses. And in that year, 5.8 billion went to the Singapore Land Authority to buy land for HDB. Uh, uh, projects. So you can say that, well, the government takes with 
from the HDB um, money for land and at the same time uh, subsidize the HDB for all the for all the construction and subsidies that is given out through the housing sector. So in that sense, um, uh, the net cost to the government is uh, not to not to be. So in terms of the overall, this is overall revenue sources of Singapore's government. Um, the land sales provide the government with a very large proportion of revenue receipts uh, in the last uh, projections. For this year, 2024, 13.5 um, billion Singapore dollars are coming in from land receipts. And the other aspects of land value capture would be the property tax, the stamp duties, the land betterment tax, etc. And also the motor vehicle taxes. Motor vehicles are taxed very heavily in Singapore. And then the sin taxes, betting, cigarettes, alcohol, etc. And all that actually accounts for half the government revenue. And because of the land, so-called land value capture, the, uh, income taxes and corporate taxes can be actually kept low and competitive uh, for investors and for those who work in Singapore. So the highest marginal income tax rate is 22%. Corporations are taxed at 17%. So um, Singapore has been able to have a home ownership rate is high and home ownership is affordable through a whole range of policies. State land for housing, the government as the largest housing developer, compulsory savings for housing finance, 1% of GDP for housing subsidies, re regulation of markets and curbs on investor and foreign demand. So it's a whole list of policies at play to enable a 90% home ownership rate. Okay. So it's not just one single policy, but numerous policies, levers that are being applied. Okay. So I now, I've been here for about three weeks and speaking to, uh, to many agencies. <laughs> Thank you for spending time with me and, um, and trying to understand what is going on in uh, Hawaii and Honolulu. And when I made the comparison between Honolulu and Singapore, um, the home ownership rate here is 58.9%. Uh, ours is much higher. Uh, and I was just looking at the supply figures since, you know, there's constantly this issue of housing crisis. And actually, when I look at the supply figures as reported in the housing, Hawaii Housing Feds book, um, there's, you have 6.3% supply over in, between 2018 and 2023, and we had 6.6%. .6%. So it's not too far off. Um, so it's a matter, but most of our supply is going to affordable housing, HDB housing. But in the in the Hawaii context, maybe it's a composition of the housing supply. If most of the housing supply actually is not affordable housing, then it, it contributes to the for affordable housing problem here. Uh, and in terms of the house price versus the income trends, if we, similarly, if we're used 2000 to now, uh, house price, the medium house price index, the price index has gone up by 3.9 times in the last 24 years. 3.5 times, the rest household incomes have increased by 1.9 times. So over time, there's this growing um, housing unaffordability for the medium household income, uh, which is um, happening in some of the high, high cost cities as well in the US. So this is a summary of um, my reading of the University of Hawaii uh, Economic Research Organization's uh, Hawaii Housing Fact Book, uh, the most recent one. And uh, Professor Justin Tindall okay, talks about the reasons behind the housing crisis in Hawaii. And he, he diagnosed the problem as coming from both the supply side and the demand side. So on the supply side, he identifies the problem as rigid regulatory barriers, slow permitting, infrastructure bottlenecks, and high interest rates, high construction costs, high land costs. And last year, the Maui fire, uh, which caused a lot of destruction and loss of lives. On the demand side, there are our buyers, our state buyers demand, demand for resorts, second home, 
short-term vacations as contributing to the outcome that prices are high. Um, you have, Hawaii has the highest medium rent and house price to income ratio of all the U.S. states. Of, uh, um, well, but then Hawaii is the most beautiful state in in U.S., so maybe that's not so surprising. Um, there's home homelessness and there is a net population outflow. So these were the findings of Professor Tyndall. And this is an interesting uh, chart that he he uh, you use in um, in his other publication called Why Are Condi Condominiums So Expensive in Hawaii? And he basically breaks it down to um, what is the cost of a 1,200 square foot condominium unit. And in Hawaii, the price is about 672,000. And if you minus the land cost and the construction cost, mm -hmm. He attributes the high cost to the regulatory cost. The red part of that cost is regulation. So this is kind of, it's, a, it's not so much that it's a regulatory cost, but it's a leftover from price minus land cost minus construction cost. And that, that is regulatory cost or a term of regulatory cost. So slow permitting, regulatory barriers, risks that the developers undertake, etc. And... Uh, the high regulatory costs therefore contributes to high housing costs in, in the state. Um, so that's his finding. And when I compare the Honolulu with Singapore, uh, on the housing supply side, actually there are many similarities. What we have done in Singapore, all the ins policy instruments that are at play are also present in Honolulu. You have... Um, very high proportion of government state land ownership as well. 50% uh, of land in Hawaii is owned by the state. And then there's affordable rental provision, but there are many agencies involved here. Um, and there is um, affordable housing for sale, uh, various schemes there. And there's also leasehold housing, which has a history in Hawaii. So it's not that leasehold housing is, uh, is not uh, it's, uh, it's a new idea um, and and then the market segmentation is not so clear the, there's just rental and then the a AMI restricted rental AMI restricted sale whereas in Singapore we really segment the market and regulate each market carefully and we have resale restrictions you have your regulated term as well so on the supply side the policy instruments that are present in Singapore are all, all present here it's just that the uh, the resources that are, say, available for permitting and for increasing the supply of housing may not be present to the same extent as in Singapore. So supply side policy instruments are there is how much they are, how much resources go into them and how much they are applied or pushed. Right? On the demand side though, there's a, a lot more, it's a lot more different. Uh, the US uses uh, your Section 8 housing vouchers so there are generous vouchers on the rental housing side. But in Singapore, our, our, our demand side policies are in the form of grants to buy housing. So we are much more generous on the grants to buy housing for first-time homeowners. Um, and uh, we don't have quite the kind of housing choice voucher system you have here in the US. And also in terms of the way we regulate demand, that's not so much present here. You have a number of bills that are in process, uh, have been proposed, such as empty homes tax, uh, trying to ban foreigners from buying housing, etc., um, which uh, are still not not effective yet. Um, then your Vice President Kamala Harris has actually proposed a 25,000 housing grant for first-time home buyers. But I'm... Um, the well, she has to be elected first and then you have to decide how to implement that if it does come about. Okay. So I, I could, I'll end with this very perceptive quote from uh, Senator Brian Schatz that um, we have created a scarcity on purpose and sometimes it's the government that creates a shortage, sometimes it's a corporation that is creating the shortage. And sometimes the solution is deregulation, sometimes it's more aggressive regulation. So sometimes the problem is not big, big enough subsidy, and sometimes the problem is subsidizing the wrong thing. Okay, but the promise, 
the premise here is that we do get to have enough of the things that we say we want and the government should be working on that. So I found that particular quote from the US Senator to be, for Hawaii to be actually very perceptive about all the complexities of trying to subsidize housing. But where, what, is the, what is the issue and where is the subsidy going to that uh, needs to be looked at carefully? Um, and so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I, I hope I've given you a broad perspective of Singapore. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. But I think if you have questions about Hawaii housing, I think there are enough people, experts here on Hawaii housing to answer your questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to, um, I'm, I'm really intrigued with the sustainability program you guys have there in Singapore. And I wanted to know a little bit no more about how did that start and if there are codes involved or I don't know if you can mention anything about that. Oh, I mean the green building programs? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. So um, we have, a, we have a, a regulations for green buildings and we have set targets for um, buildings to be green by some percentage by 2030, etc. So there are green building codes in place. Uh, we, the building how the building construction authority is in charge of those um, building codes, and uh, the target is to get eighty percent of all buildings green by twenty thirty. Mm -hmm. So targets are in place, and for HDB sector, um, the HDB sector as is a government sector. All the government sector buildings have to be green, uh, mm -hmm. and yes. Yeah. You've uh, talked about the You Hero study. They put a big emphasis on the gap between uh, median income and the median price of housing and say that 80% of the people in Hawaii, uh, you know, fall below the median. And that's, I mean, below the price that they can get a median house at. 80%, only 20% can afford yes. the median priced house. So there's... If that's an important way to look at it, we have a tremendous gap between, uh, you know, what people can afford and the housing that's built here. And of course, Singapore took care of that problem. Uh, what would you think about how we might fill that tremendous gap, which as you referred to, is sending our people to the mainland where they can afford housing? <sighs> Actually, I was quite impressed with what was going on already in terms of in the last few years, the housing bills that have been passed. So there seems to be recently a lot of activity in terms of trying to build 99 year leasehold housing. I think Senator Chang is quite a prime mover of that. And then I, when I visited the uh, school housing authority, they had this PPP pilot going on uh, to build workforce housing. Um, in a, in a, in a school setting for teach, just rental housing, so I think the the way to look at it is how much more supply of affordable housing can be pushed out in the near future, and I think the PPP solution is very promising. Um, if you start with the having teachers being able to afford housing in this PPP rental projects and you scale that if that pilot is successful and if that can be scaled up um, across all the districts and even extend to not just um, the, the teachers but also all public sector workers, health workers, workers in the tourism industry. I mean that would actually, that approach might actually be quite a promising one in terms of cutting down, cutting down permitting time etc. Um, and so I was, I was quite inspired when I talked to the school housing authority as to what they were doing with that particular pilot to provide workforce housing. And on the, on the uh, housing, leasehold housing for sale, I understand many agencies are now involved in trying to supply leasehold housing for sale. And I think Senator Chang might have a better idea of all the different uh, projects that are ongoing on the 99-year lease uh, pilots that are that are being uh, trial. So if, um, I mean, we could, in the Singapore context, when we use state land for 
public housing for housing supply, whether it is public house public housing, we don't call it PPP for so for public sector, but the executive condominium scheme that is a PPP project, and if this PPP projects can be scaled up uh, and uh, made available to the seg segment of a population that can't afford uh, to buy at the medium house price rate, then I think that's a promising way to look at it. But I think what, what is required is that the government takes a more active role in terms of supplying, uh, being responsible for supply of affordable housing. Uh, that's my, my view after looking at uh, the, the, the various schemes that you have in place here. Hi, hopefully a quick question. Um, why does anyone buy a second home in Singapore? Sorry? Why does anyone buy a second home in Singapore? What, do they, is there any substantial profit in it? Uh, well, it, with the increase in house prices over time, um, housing was considered a good investment before all these stamp duty uh, policies uh, came into place. So people buy housing as an investment because of rental income, but more because of... Uh, a, house price appreciation and then for foreigners perhaps uh, it is foreigners there are, there's a large proportion of foreigners in Singapore and Singapore attracts uh, a lot of foreign uh, expatriates from across the world and re recently we had many buyers from China and we always had buyers from Indonesia and Malaysia as well so the private condominium segment is actually um, many foreigners are there but with all the recent curbs in uh, uh, increasing the stamp duties for foreigners that demand has actually come down tremendously did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Well, so it seems like it, it doesn't appreciate that much is that right? Uh, yes it's, people are realizing that the government is acting so that it won't appreciate so much <laughs> thank you so obviously the CPF has played a very important role, right, yes. in Singapore. But, but what, what would you suggest, uh, I mean, you know, what would be the alternative way? I mean, where there is no, like, provident fund. Suppose the whole pension system is pay-as-you-go and there is no individual account, yes. right? So what do you suggest? Uh, I mean, how do they... <laughs> oh. <laughs> Um, well, the pension fund housing finance system was set up in Singapore during a time when the mortgage market wasn't working or wasn't providing mortgages for low-income, even middle-income households. So this is a kind of solution that was put in place because there was no mortgage market. But I think in, in the, say, in the US context, in the developed country context, Canada, etc., the mortgage market is, is functioning well, right? And therefore, there is less of a need to and um, not absent the subprime crisis problem we, we had in 2009, uh, uh, there there is flow of funds to the to into this sector that and we don't require a housing pension uh, system which can actually be very distortionary. Okay, so a number of countries have adopted this housing provident fund system, but when you don't have a most universal home ownership for everybody, the end result is that th those who rent actually end up subsidizing the owners who, are, who use the fund for buying. So that's what an equity issue that, you know, that happens when you have, uh, when you use a housing provident fund system. And a number of countries have adopted it, but I think where the mortgage market is developed and well-regulated, uh, there's no need for a housing provident fund, uh, which can be distortionary. I think Europe uses a contractual savings scheme instead, where the individual contracts with a bank um, in a, under a savings scheme so that uh, it's, it's uh, by choice rather than compulsory. HDB, what is their average cost to develop a, a thousand square foot unit? And, and what's the average soft cost? So the difference between the hard cost for construction and the soft cost to, to close. Do, do you... You know that number offhand? Uh, the construction costs, um, based on the contractor contracts that go up and are bidded for, I think it's in the region of US about $130 per square foot. Per square foot. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. the soft costs? Really? And the soft costs would be based on the uh, subsidies that are going out per flat. You could add about another, um, easily another $100 more to 
Wow, so that's pretty substantial. I mean, it's like 40% of, um, of the development cost. Well, maybe not as much, but the, the issue is that in, in the HDB context, the pricing is not reflective of the cost. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's controlled, right? It's, it's controlled. Right. And it's actually the bigger house, bigger flat types that pay a higher, yeah, higher, higher, higher price. Yeah. And that is a lot of cross subsidization involved. Yeah. Yeah. So the bigger flat types end up paying more per square foot than the smaller flat types. Right. And and that's to make sure that the housing gets affordable. It becomes affordable to all income you, categories. You know, I, I, I asked the question because Senator Chang has been really instrumental in, in mm. trying to have uh, promote more of a, a government role. Yes. Yeah. When we look at housing development costs in Hawaii. They've recently eclipsed seven hundred thousand dollars, you know, a unit, which is um, more than California in many instances, right? The, you know, positions us as the highest construction cost in in the United States, but thirty percent of that or more, we've just recently looked at a number of deals, is soft costs. So it's financing costs to close LIHTC and senior debt and and gap financing that's required. So there's a lot of costs. There's a lot of inefficiency in the way that we finance projects. And, and one of the things I think would, that would be interesting to compare is how we could do that more efficiently here based on you know, how, the, how the HDB funds yes. projects. You know, it, does the government have the opportunity for more of a role um, to help finance projects to reduce, you know, in, in an effort to reduce those yes. costs? Oh, I think if we look at financing costs, uh, especially very low, um, in I mean, in in the HDB context, because they get their funding from the from the government, so there's there's no. So is there is there an equivalent role that the government here could potentially play to help reduce the soft costs to be more efficient? It seems like we're we're losing. There's a lot of fat in the deals. So yeah, I was very intrigued by this chart that Professor Tindall produced about how the regulatory cost component is 58% of the price. It's like contributes $320 per square foot. You know, so what goes into this regulatory cost? And most most um, affordable housing units that are developed in Hawaii are developed with affordable housing tax credits. And, and with the, Private activity bonds available to the state, plus the low income housing tax rates. You can build 1,400, 1,500 units a year. That's that's the max. And it's incredibly inefficient because this low income housing tax credits generally trade at about 90 cents on the dollar or less for the federal tax credits. And the state also provides a five unit credit that will typically trade at around 60 cents on the dollar. So, trying to, you know, if we could bring that's those state tax credits and try to make them available to more investors to get a higher price, that would help us, you know, reduce the financing cost. But also if there were a way for the government to step in and provide maybe initial financing so we could take a lot of the players out of the equation and reduce the soft costs that are just getting bled out um, as part of closing these very complex transactions. Yes, yeah, so, and I, and that was why I, I mentioned the PPPP approach, yeah. Yeah, yeah, where actually if it is permitting infrastructure and if all those costs are actually more efficiently taken care of by the public sector, then when it go when the project goes out to the private sector, private sector is only responsible for construction and a smaller proportion of that soft cost. Need more money for the <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I think that's <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question about kind of the shift in mindset that would be needed for people here to want some of these policies, because I feel like um, housing here is kind of viewed as an investment piece that you know, because it appreciates so much. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, in the transition period when Singapore was moving towards this, how was, was it difficult? I mean, I was sure it was, but how do you think about that mindset, my mindset shift to the buy-in from the public to want 
more housing, which would then depreciate the cost of their investment, essentially. Uh, I think the reason why the HDB continues to be a popular investment for almost every new household coming to is that they are subsidized and that when they buy a flat, they know that in five years' time when they are ready to sell the flat or they can sell the flat, it's going to fetch a much higher price than what they paid for it. So that is kind of monetizing of the subsidy the government has given to them. And well, after that, when it, if they sell in the resale market, it provides them a step up to sit in a bigger flat or private housing. Or eventually, if they decide that they want to downsize to a smaller unit, you know, the, the flat has retained its value. So the fact that HDB flats have been perceived as a good investment she makes, continues to make it attractive. And uh, if it's, as you can see, the HDB continues to be subsidized by the government for upgrading, for maintenance, and um, conservancy charges are much lower. The government continues to actually flow resources to HDB households based on flat size. It's like when you have an increase in the sales tax, or there is going to be a redistribution back to the uh, back to households, and it, it goes by um, the generosity or the rebates is dependent on the size of the flat you live in, etc. So the HDB flat becomes a way in which fiscal transfers take place as well. Um, so overall, um, people are happy to invest in a HDB flat because they perceive it as an as an asset that will grow in value. But of course, as the flat ages. I mean, people are now talking about how can a 70-year-old flat, say, eventually when it gets there, be an asset. But I think there's a point in time where the increase in price has taken place at already at the 5-year, 10-year mark. And at the 70-year mark, I think we might have an aging population who are downsizing or people who are actually wanting to pay for a longer rental lease. But since a the, since, uh, uh, flat with an older lease, a uh, shorter lease has left, um, will fetch a lower price. You know, basically the market will adjust. Okay, but we are still at this stage in the in the development where house prices have only seen an increase. And HDB prices have only seen an increase. And for the for the private housing sector, because of the collective sales process, they are able to get out of that ninety nine year lease by through a collective sale as well, um, if the conditions are right. So um, there are all these other so-called exit paths for the leasehold system. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fong. Thank you. Thank you.